So uh, I'm David Gregg. I'm the executive director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey, and you are here at the Zoom presentation of our uh, 2021 annual meeting. Uh, uh, we're going to have a brief annual meeting because we have some business to conduct uh, tonight, and then after that, we're going to have our featured speaker, Ian Ives. Uh, just a few notes uh, to everybody. First of all, this is being recorded, and um, those of you who are familiar with our YouTube channel will probably expect this to appear in a hashtag Natural History Tuesday video in the coming week or so. I'll probably do two, one with the annual meeting and one with Ian's presentation so that you can watch the one you like. Um, the uh, you can put questions in the chat and Kyra is going to be monitoring the chat and she can forward questions along to me, to Ian or to whoever seems to be the right person. And uh, we are also going to have, we'll, we will have a, a, a pause for any questions at the end of the annual meeting. Um, and then we will go on from there. So um, the Natural History Survey is a for those of you, again, who are not familiar, is a 501c3 nonprofit. We are a membership organization, and the, the dues-paying members help to support all of our public programs and provide the money that we use for things that, that nobody else will provide money for, like, like public programs and bio blitzes and walks and stuff like that. So um, a big thank you to everybody uh, here who is a member and has supported us for the last year so that we can make it to, to our next annual, annual meeting. Uh, if you're not a member, uh, the member, basic membership is $25. It's not a ton of dough, but it makes a big difference to us. Um, there are about 400 members out there, and uh, we'd love to have you join us too if you're not already a member. Um, I'd like to thank the board of directors. There are a whole ton of you on right now, but um, the board has been spectacular during COVID coming uh, to board meetings virtually and staying engaged and giving lots of useful input and assistance throughout the year. So thanks everybody um, on the board and thanks to Kyra. Kyra um, has saved a lot of trouble not arranging refreshments tonight, but she did lots of other things like organizing um, the rehearsal for the Zoom and other stuff like that. So. Thank you, Kyra, for, for everything you do that has gotten us through this year. Um, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll just start with, um, uh, let's see. So, you know, this time last year, you thought, uh, we probably thought that this was what this, this was what this year was gonna look like, that we were going down a black hole um, and uh, that's not the case. So uh, this time last year, we had uh, we had had an open house in January, uh, and we opened a new art exhibit. And almost no one has seen this art exhibit. Unfortunately, the artists are already coming and taking their work back, and we have not hung a new show. Um, to replace it, but we absolutely will. The art exhibits have been terrific uh, for three or four years, the four years that we've been doing them, and we look forward to doing them again. So if you are an artist or you know artists who are inspired by the natural world, encourage them to be in touch with us because we would love to meet new artists and uh, feature you in our next open house, whenever that is. Uh, in February, before the black hole hit, we also did the, the previous Nature Video Festival with the Environment Council of Rhode Island, and we did a couple of last Wednesday teas before everything hit. But then, uh, after mid-March, we uh, had to start canceling things, and we we canceled our bioblitz we were planning in Cumberland, and we substituted the Rhode Island Backyard bioblitz which was, a, I see I've got the, I've left the wrong numbers in the bottom, but for the Backyard BioBlitz, we had 350 participants at 160 locations. There were six, there were more than 6,000 observations of more than 1,400 species. So that was absolutely terrific. And people had a great time exploring 
uh, places that they probably wouldn't have otherwise. Other things that we did uh, that during the last year that we've been doing uh, before COVID, we're able to continue. And we have continued with our coyote ecology research with Dr. Numi Mitchell and the folks at DEM. Uh, it's funded by primarily by a grant from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but it also uh, we also have a lot of support from Prince Charitable Trusts and uh, a number of other private donors and and businesses. The the um, the picture of the blue spaghetti on your right is actually the tracking data for coyotes that were collared in Roger Williams Park in Providence, and it shows that they are moving through the neighborhoods there and um, finding really good habitat uh, to get about their business. The middle picture is a, a picture of three coyote pups that, that were um, uh, born near Johnson and Wales at, uh, at the edge of the of Providence Port. It was interesting to speculate. They, they were denned right next to a, a ball field, which without COVID would have been full of people and probably not a good coyote den site. But since it was really quiet, the coyotes took it over. And it was kind of interesting to think about wildlife coming out from, uh, you know, out from hiding uh, when we got all in hiding. Um, and... We also have had to come up with some new outreach um, channels for our coyote project. It, outreach to the public was one of the essential parts of the research. And um, we had planned community meetings and uh, door to door, door, -to -door um, uh, information sessions. So we have been working on uh, an exhibit that we hope to put up soon at Roger Williams Park Zoo. We also have on the right a sign which we've been putting up at Johnson and Wales to try to discourage people from um, acclimating the new pups there to, to humans. Now that litter is grown up and probably are, are um, uh, found a new, a new territory or are wandering around uh, looking for a territory and there'll be a new litter shortly. So, um, but we've been able to do some really cool things uh, with those. Now, the other thing that we've done in the last year is we have reinstituted our bulletin and the old timers among you will recognize our first bulletin. This is volume one, number one, September, 1994. But last fall we put out uh, we, we restarted the Rhode Island Naturalist after a hiatus of a number of years, and uh, enormous thanks are due to, to Bob Kenny and Stephen Hale, who are the co-editors, uh, but also to a lot of the board members who contributed materials and helped us with reviewing and, and organizing and stuff like that. Um, and Kyra did the layout, learning some new skills as, as she did it. So, And then another issue came out. Uh, in just a, a month or so ago, and we just put out a special issue, which is the first time we've done a special issue, uh, and this one is on research on salt marsh sparrows that uh, Steve Reinert and a bunch of other people have been doing. So uh, that is a big accomplishment that we were able to do, um, COVID or no COVID. We are also continuing with our Wildlife Action Plan Liaison Project, which is kind of a collaboration with DEM and the Nature Conservancy, where it's sometimes hard to understand um, what the policy priorities are unless you're conversant in the wildlife action plan and the wildlife management policies and planning projects. Amanda Freitas, who helps to interpret these things for local officials. So we're continuing with that project. Tom Kutcher is continuing with his wetlands uh, program development. He has developed two things, a salt marsh ramp, which is a restoration and monitoring plant, restoration and monitoring program. He has a salt marsh ramp and he has a fresh water ramp. And he has had, uh, he, he's worked on nine salt marshes during um, COVID times. And he's had quarterly salt marsh ramp meetings with more than 30 attendees and uh, 
this project has attracted attention from 19 agent agencies across the Northeast. So a number of other states are actually now wanting to be trained in the, the monitoring protocol that we've developed here at the Natural History Survey. So that's really cool and that has continued. And we've had our Distinguished Naturalists, uh, uh, Distinguished Naturalist Awards. We did a program uh, uh, in our um, YouTube channel for our awards night, which we would normally have at a, a public event such as this tonight. So our Distinguished Naturalists uh, for this year are really bird focused. We had Ray Larson, who, who actually also works on Odinates, but um, is well-known as a birder, um, Dick Farron, a well-known birder, and the Posthumous Distinguished Naturalist Award went to Mary Jo Murray, also really engaged in getting people birding. Now we had our Golden Eye Award, which this year went to two people, Bill Sharkey for um, his discovery of a skink, and Suzanne Payton for finding us the second population of spadefoot toads that we that we know of. There's been another one found since then, but at the time we we had given up hope that another would be found, and she found it. So, um, and we had a new award. This is the Founders Service Award, and uh, the first Founders Service Award went to the Sharp family. Uh, Hank and Peggy and Julie and Henry have done an enormous amount for conservation in Rhode Island generally, but an enormous amount for the Natural History Survey in particular. They really have helped us get on our feet and helped us get to the next level when we were a much smaller organization and had aspirations. So um, we recognized their contributions with this new award. Now, uh, we will be awarding another round, doing another round of awards in the near future. So if you, have someone you think would be a good candidate for the Distinguished Naturalist Award, for uh, the Golden Eye, uh, or for the Founder Service Award, where we always take suggestions. Um, the Distinguished Naturalist Award is um, one where a nomination letter with details of the, of the particular person's um, contributions would be really welcome. The golden eye, the way you get nominated for the golden eye is you submit a finding of something remarkable or interesting to the Natural History Survey. And so, you know, that will help us to document the biodiversity of Rhode Island. And you you might get a golden eye if you if you have discovered the most amazing thing of the year. So this year we did another uh, nature video festival and um, it was really enjoyable. Uh, we had we had special features this year that we haven't had before. So the uh, video festival is kind of growing up a little bit. We had 21 submissions. We had a jury of distinguished experts. Um, we had some prizes and we had special features. And we also had live appearances by these, these two grizzled veterans of the Rhode Island environmental sphere. Um, and... Uh, and speaking of, of video appearances, one of the things that has been a hallmark of 2020 has been our pivot to video. Aren't we all pivoting to video? Uh, but we've really put a lot of energy into our YouTube channel. And uh, if, you, uh, if you haven't found it yet, I encourage you to do that. Um, so since this time in 2020, we've put up 37 videos plus four live broadcasts. We have had 8,200 views of those videos for a total of 867 hours of viewing. And we have had 183 new subscribers. You Look, we hit 200 subscribers yesterday. So this is really exciting. And uh, I encourage anybody who is interested in seeing what we discover every week in our hashtag natural history Tuesday videos to uh, find your way to our YouTube channel, RI Natural History, all, all one word, and smash that subscribe button, uh, as the kids say. And that'll help us find even more people because it'll, it'll fuel the algorithm. 
So one of the, our most recent projects has been Operation Spadefoot RI, and this is kind of where this is kind of uh, a little um, a little bit of uh, foreshadowing for tonight's program. Uh, we built two new breeding pools for Rhode Island's rarest amphibian, thanks to South Kingstown Land Trust, who provided the land and a whole slew of other organizations and people who were um, who spent three days out there uh, schlepping dirt and rocks and sticks and and straw and all kinds of stuff. And uh, you you could see a video of the whole thing if you went to our YouTube channel. The other thing I wanted to be sure to mention and to, to thank everybody for was the spectacular success of 401 Gives. So this was a one day fundraising event organized by the United Way. And the idea was to create buzz around philanthropic giving in Rhode Island and really encourage people to support the nonprofits that are doing things that they care about. And the Natural History Survey set as a goal, um, as many individual donors as we could get and never mind the size of the gift because really involvement is, is what we want. And we had 159 donors, which was the 21st, uh, the 21st largest number of donors out of 422 organizations. So, wow, congratulations to you all who made that happen. And um, we raised $13,448, which was 47th out of 422. And again, for a small organization, that is truly remarkable. So thank you, everybody. Okay, so now we come to the financial part of the evening. And um, the annual meeting is one of the times when uh, uh, the governance of the Natural History Survey the board and, and myself, the executive director, um, are accountable to you, the members. Uh, we try to show you that we still have money. Um, we are, go, we are do, sort of doing the right thing, hopefully seeing the numbers go the right direction. So these are some numbers that I pulled for the, um, for the pa past number of years. So you can look at trends. Uh, you'll see that our net assets are, um, increasing and that actually has been really important because we have a cash reserve which has you know it's really been nice to know that we weren't just weeks away from from the end through covid and so that's been really important um you'll also see that the organization has been um about a six hundred and fifty thousand dollar a year organization that is a number where we tend to have relatively you know relatively balanced budgets at about that size. Um, you will see that the net revenue for this year was down 14,400, um, uh, was, was a loss of 14,400 um, compared to uh, a, um, a profit of 31,000 last year. And I think that what you're looking at is, is COVID. You're looking at the, the cancellation of BioBlitz and of our November, um, uh, Natural History Week uh, fundraiser. Uh, we, however, did receive a uh, PPP loan um, as part of um, the COVID stimulus uh, package, and that loan was forgiven. And so that provides us cash to, um, to put towards this small deficit in um, 2020. And we're projecting a small deficit in 2021, but again, that's something that will be um, covered by this, um, by the PPP loan. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of the trends, um, this, is the, this is the numbers for the surveys, uh, IRS 990 line 18 back to 1996. So you can kind of see uh, how things go up and down. And again, I just say, that when we're a six hundred thousand dollar or up organization, the budgets tend to work out better than when we're smaller than that. Um, and so, where does that six hundred thousand uh, dollars come from? So these are revenues, and you'll see that the red, the red bar, the red part of the bar is earned income. And this, these are these are corrected; these are standardized. Um, 
percentages so that they're comparable, but you'll see the earned income is red and that's primarily contracts that we do such as the wildlife action plan liaison and the wetlands um, program development uh, project. The, uh, then we have grants and donations and membership and donations and membership has been steadily rising through the years and again I'm we're all so grateful for the support that everybody has been putting into this um, really a, a sense that um, together we can we can make the Natural History Survey uh, strong and um, a, a valuable participant in all these all these cool projects so that that's kind of like um, input that's really coming from the membership specifically uh, the you know the earned income is it's a lot of dollars but um, it's it's not it's not personal it's just it's jobs so that that I really look at that donation and membership um, the rise there and think that how important that is um, okay so um, these this just shows trends in assets um, and unrestricted cash and again you see a small drop in unrestricted cash in the last year this just shows that we have a cash reserve we we, we had none and at the end of 2012, if we had COVID in 2013, it would have been bad, um, but uh, we are going to be able to continue with our projects and all the cool stuff that we're doing. Okay, so now we come to uh, the other sort of legal part of the annual meeting, and that is the um, election of the board of directors. So these are the current members of the board of directors. And uh, we have one person who's stepping down and that's Malia Schwartz. And Malia has been on the board for a really long time. Um, man, 15 or between 15 and 20 years anyway. And she was a president, um, she served a term as president. So super valuable. Uh, to us in many ways, and and just thank you very much to Malia for uh, her work uh, on behalf of the survey. And we have um, a, a new person joining us uh, this year, and that is James Waters, uh, who's an associate professor uh, at Providence College, and he studies the um, metabolism of ants. And um, he's also kind of egged us all into being a lot more interested in the ants in every nook and cranny of Rhode Island. And um, it's been really fun learning, learning the ants and exploring with uh, James. And I'm really glad that he's agreed to join the board of directors. So this is the slate of uh, the board of directors that was um, recommended by the nominating committee. And we have had a vote. We, um, oh, over a hundred of you, I think have voted. And um, it is an overwhelming vote in favor of this slate of directors. So thank you everybody for that. And uh, we, the nominating committee has um, put forward these five people as the next executive committee of the board of directors. So uh, now that we've had, uh, at the conclusion of this meeting, the directors will rotate and then they will vote, um, officially vote in this um, slate of officers for the coming year. So uh, this is, these are the officer nominees. And um, when we're talking about officers, we want to thank Emily Holland for her service as president. So Emily is um, finishing her term as president, and she has been really energetic and creative and um, always thinking about natural history. She um, is one of the people who found a skink in the last year, um, and that's really, really interesting. So um, thank you for, for your commitment and time and energy, Emily. So then thank you uh, to you all for attending tonight's annual meeting. And 
that's my last slide. And so what I'm going to do now is pause to see if anybody has any questions, um, see what the chat looks like, um, anything about the operations of the Natural History Survey, about our um, projects of the last year, uh, and or where we're going in the future. So. Nothing for you in the chat right now, David. So I'll just say that, um, you know, we're a, we're a, a 501c3. We are an, a membership organization. So you all are the Natural History Survey. And um, what we do should be transparent and, and explainable to you. If you ever have any questions or you want to know more about the Natural History Survey, what we're doing, um, please pick up the phone and give me a call or drop me an email. Um, hopefully soon our office will be open again and you can come in and, and we can talk to you in person.